Good morning to all my friends and family, and welcome to Jim's 5am Club. It's a wonderful, wonderful, glorious morning. The beginning of yet another awesome day for each and every one of us. And I'm up here at Bronte on the cliff face. I'll just show you where I am. And as you can see, it's just beautiful sandstone cliff face. overlooking the uh, Pacific Ocean and we have a magnificent sunrise and today I want to talk to you about a topic which is near and dear to my heart and I guess near and dear to every every uh, Greek and Phil Helene's heart last night I had the honor the absolute honor of going to an event hosted by the Athenian Association at the um, Sydney Girls High School um, Auditorium. And they had two eminent speakers, two uh, eminent Australians who are leading the charge internationally for the uh, restoration of the uh, Parthenon marbles. So what I want to do today is I want to dedicate this 5am club to uh, the message that was resonated so eloquently yesterday by the, the two speakers, most notably David Hill and Jeffrey Robinson. Jeffrey Robinson, who uh, most people know from the, uh, the, the show on television known as The Hypothetical, and it was just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's continue. Let's continue along our way here and uh, just see where it leads us because it is a magnificent topic and a topic that uh, is not only important to Greeks throughout the world, but it's important for all free people, regardless of the culture. So uh, David Hill, kicked off the, the night where he talked about the fact that the uh, British, British Museum and Britain, Britain in general um, are completely out of touch and out of step with the world when it comes to uh, the protection and the reunification of the Parthenon marbles. And Britain, at this point, has absolutely no friends when it comes to, uh, to this topic. And he also made a very important point to let us know that Boris Johnson is also opposed to the reunification of the marbles. And it's causing, or will cause, some challenges going forward. So according to David Hill, and Geoffrey Robinson, um, any diplomatic path to have the reunica reunification of the marbles is a complete waste of time, as it's always been a waste, an absolute waste of time. So it was interesting to find out that Australia is one of 18 countries throughout the world who are supporting Greece's efforts to gain the return of the marbles. And we've had many in the past who have led the charge, including Gough Whitlam. So uh, I guess the, mo the, the biggest lesson that I learnt last night is that sometimes Phil Hellenes, lovers of Greece, lovers of uh, the classics, in many ways are more Greek than us Greeks because they choose to support, they choose to love Greece, they choose to accept her and to admire her. So it's important to have that at the back of our minds. So interestingly enough, the Australian contingent made up of uh, David Hill, 
and Jeffrey Robinson actually went to Greece um, back when Samaras was the uh, Prime Minister. And they encouraged Greece to launch a legal battle to uh, have the marbles, the Parthenon marbles, the beautiful, most beautiful Parthenon marbles returned to Greece, but that offer was declined. So um, it's interesting to understand that it's not coming just from Greece. There are people, there are 18 countries and there are countless other people throughout the world who see this massive injustice and are calling out um, and building a head of steam to hopefully one day have these, uh, these artefacts, these cu cultural artefacts returned to their home because I'll go on now and talk about what uh, Jeffrey Robertson, the uh, international, um, international QC, the, uh, the master of international law, had to say about it as well. Uh, because Jeffrey Robertson is a QC, as I said. He's a, he's a, a magnificent, a magnificent thinker and a, a human right, rights advocate. And he said, at the beginning of his presentation, he said quite clearly that he has no Greek ancestry that he is aware of. Absolutely no Greek ancestry. But he said, categorically, he said that we all must understand that the marbles, the Parthenon marbles, the freezers that were illegally stolen from the, uh, the Parthenon are not Greek. He said they're more than just Greek. He said that they are, they belong to the whole world as they are a contributor, a contributing, a co a contributing factor and part of the fabric of our modern civilization and modern society. Because he says they belong to the world, they belong to the free people. Because they began as an idea. And often we hear that one of the greatest gifts that the Greeks gave the world was the art of Greek thought, the freedom of speech, democracy, and all of those other foundational elements that we live by today and uh, we enjoy today and many, many countries throughout the world enjoy. So Greece has been able to morph itself and to uh, infuse its elements into many, many parts of the world and many cultures. So he went on to say that it began as an idea and as an expression of an idea round about 450 BC. And we're talking about two and a half thousand years ago where the idea of democracy, the idea of individual liberty, the idea of living a dignified life. And uh, in the artwork that was captured on the friezes of the uh, Parthenon, the pantheatic procession, according to Geoffrey Robinson, the magnificent pantheatic procession captured the enduring brilliance the enduring brilliance, just like we're capturing the enduring brilliance of the sun out there, it captured the enduring brilliance of uh, Phidias, the, uh, the sculpture. And he says that uh, what is important for us all to understand, to, em uh, to embrace and to appreciate and to celebrate is that in that procession, in that artwork, 
we captured things which are just magical. The idea, the simple idea that humans can meet together in a democratic society and enjoy their life of freedom. The um, 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 Jeff, Jeffrey Robertson <coughs> actually choked up a bit when he said this. And I can sense that he is a, an indeed a lover of all of these things that he talks about, and it's not just an act. He said that the procession that was captured on the uh, Parthenon freezers is like an ancient newsreel, an ancient newsreel that, had, that captured a time and place which happened two and a half thousand years ago, where it is a picture, a beautiful, a most beautiful, beautiful picture of the beginning of civilization as we know it today. We get to see the, the glory of what Athens enjoyed, celebrated and reflected in 440 BC. In many ways, it's the first, the very, very first picture of our modern democratic society with people walking, with people talking, with people celebrating, with people playing sport, with people enjoying music, theatre, and all of the, uh, the aesthetically uh, um, tasteful things that we do today. These are, the, these are the things that a good life enjoys today. All of those things that Phidias was able to permanently capture in timeless fashion back in 440 BC. So according to Jeffrey Robertson, and I guess we can all agree to a certain extent, that this is the first picture of human civilization, the way we see us and the way we e exist today. But it happened back then for the very, very first time. And that in, in itself simply needs to be respected, acknowledged and preserved. Because Pericles, the great leader, the great Athenian leader, in his uh, funeral oration, said and proudly said, and th these words echo throughout all ages, that we, we are a government of the many and not the few. A government of the many and not the few. Because I learnt last night, and I, I didn't know this, but immigrants in ancient Greece were allowed to belong. Even though they couldn't vote, they were, they were able to be part of the free life, so long, of course, as they paid their taxes. <laughs> how interesting, how wonderful is that? As long as they paid their taxes, they were able to belong and be full members of the society, not voting members, of course. But the, in these ways, we could see the seeds of our very own values and civilization. So these are the greatest survivors of our ancient world. Just as an aside, what I want to add here is that many, many years ago, when I was in Athens, I went to the Acropolis and I always go, I always venture and go to the Acropolis, even though nobody else wants to come with me. Everybody else is, uh, whenever I say, let's go to the Acropolis, they'll always come up with an excuse these days. But I always, every time I'm in Athens, I always make a point to go back there. Because like the most beautiful, the most glorious mistress, you can never, ever get enough of her. Every time I go to the Acropolis, and I remember the first time I went was when I was a university student back in 1982. I went with the university tour. I went to Athens. 
But um, since then, as I said, I've been going every year. And one year I decided to tag on to an American group where there was an American professor who was talking to the students. And he said quite confidently and, and eloquently that the Parthenon is indeed the most beautiful um, artwork um, in the world for a number of reasons. And he talked about the curvature and the, uh, the way it was designed and, and all of the other things from a artistic perspective, which I appreciated and loved. But the thing that stood out and the thing that I love the most was when he said the following. He said that Pericles, back in the day when they were building and designing and planning to uh, express the greatness of, uh, of Hellenism to the world, a message that would be, that would carry through the generations. He said he didn't want the, the, the memory and the, uh, the theatre of ancient Greece to be spoilt by, by, the th the, by the thought that slave labour was used in its creation. So he decreed back then that all people, all people working on the Parthenon were to get paid, paid a fair day's pay so that nobody but nobody could ever say that the Greeks created this monument, this eternal monument, based on the pain and suffering of other people. So everybody who was included and involved in the building and the expression of this procession and this love were people who were paid and part of a democratic society. So what I'll do is, um, this is gonna be lengthy, so please uh, forgive me, but it's so, so important for me to get it out, to express it, because it impacted me so much last night. I've never ever been in an audience where I've been so captivated by the speaker, by the message, and by this, uh, this push, this push for, for justice. So the next thing that um, Jeffrey Robinson went on to talk about was a bit of the history in terms of how the Parthenon marbles ended up in the London Museum and just some of the facts that we all need to be aware of. And the first thing he talks about was the, uh, the gallery, the gallery in the museum where they're housed and just some of the history of the British Museum, just to put things into, uh, into perspective. So what he said is that the uh, Parthenon marbles are housed and in England, in Britain, they're called the, um, um, anyway, it just escapes me for now, it'll come back because I know them now solely as the Parthenon marbles. But he says that um, <clears throat> the Parthenon marbles are housed in a, in a gallery called the Duvain, the Duvain Gallery in London. And they were named after a fraudster. And Geoffrey Robinson made this very, very clear. Ah, so yeah, just going back. So they're, they're, in England, they're known as um, Oh, it just keeps on escaping me, so <laughs> forgive me, it'll come back. So in the Devain Gallery in London, they're named after a fraudster. A fraudster, uh, Joseph Devain, who was a Jew, a corrupt art dealer who, believe it or not, bought the, uh, the artwork, bought the paintings for the uh, British Museum from uh, artwork that was confiscated by the Gestapo. They were uh, stolen, stolen items. And um, 
he, uh, he was the middleman that was able to procure uh, artwork for the gallery um, that was uh, illegally procured. So artwork that was confiscate, confiscated, confiscated by the Nazis, by the Gestapo, and those efforts bought him a, uh, a lordship, they bought him fame, and he ended up buying himself a, a place, a time and space in the British Museum known as the Duvain Gallery. And what he did once his gallery was named and uh, dedicated to him, his first request, his first order was to make sure that the Parthenon marbles that were going to be housed there were going to be stripped of all their colour. So he organised for people to come in with crowbars, with chisels, with implements to scrape all the colour off the Parthenon marbles because he wanted them to be as white as white. And this happened in 1937. So uh, they were housed in a gallery that was set up, owned and dedicated to a fraudster, a Jewish art collector who, uh, who procured paintings and artwork that had been confiscated by the Gestapo. So it just goes to show that, you know, the, the filth, according to uh, Jeffrey Robinson, that uh, we were involved with. And all of this was hushed up. It was hushed up by the custodians of the museum and of the British government. So in a nutshell, Jeffrey Robinson is saying to us that these artworks that were housed in the museum were desecrated, were desecrated. So the next question is, and, it, and he answers so eloquently, is how, I've got an audience of a pigeon here, so at least I've got one, an audience of one to listen to my story today, where I'm relaying what I heard and learnt last night. How did they get there? How did the Elgin marbles, there's the word, how did the Elgin marbles, and I just can't get it out of my mouth, how did the Parthenon marbles, which are attributed to Elgin, get to London in the first place? So this is where Geoffrey Robinson has done a lot and lot of research and is able to tell us the story and I'll take you through the story as well for those who want to hang on. It is worth listening to. So he says that it's all based on a lie, a massive, massive lie. And it was a lie from the very, very start. And interesting to, in, interestingly to note when people say that, oh, we've, we haven't made an effort, the Greeks haven't cared about the marbles. Jeffrey Robinson informed us all that in 1836, the King of Greece made a case for their return back to Greece using diplomatic sources. And over 200 years have passed with useless di diplomacy. So uh, Jeffrey Robinson informs us and makes a very, very clear point that diplomacy is not going to work in this case. The only way Greece is going to be able to get the marbles, the Parthenon marbles, reunified with the marbles back in Athens is through the law, and not just any law, but international law. So the per first point we need to understand from a legal perspective, an international law perspective, according to this brilliant international lawyer, is that the marbles were stolen. There is no doubt about it. 
the marbles were stolen. So let's go back to the story. So back in 1801, back before Elgin even made it to Greece, back in 1801, Athens only had about 10,000 Athenians because Athens had been under Turkish occupation, as we all know, and um, the oppression, uh, the situation um, left Athens with only 10,000 people. And they were occupied by the Ottoman Turks. So Greece was occupied for almost 400 years by the Ottoman Turks. But the Ottoman Turks, according to Geoffrey Robinson, once again, I learned something new yesterday, had one good thing going for them, that they saw themselves in many respects as custodians of the temples, the art and the monuments that they had under their uh, stewardship. So to a certain extent, even the Turks, even the Ottoman Turks respected the temples and what they had available to them or what they had um, under their uh, watchful eye. So from a government perspective, from a cultural perspective, Geoffrey Robinson reminds us that they were to be protected. Before the British got to, uh, to Greece, to Athens, there were the French. And the French, like every other culture, all wanted to be a part of Greece and wanted to take and to uh, incorporate the classics into their culture. So they too tried, but tried in vain to get hold of things uh, from the Parthenon, from the uh, Acropolis. So back in 1780, when they were in uh, Athens and had, uh, I guess, a leveraged and a privileged sort of uh, position, they uh, applied to the Ottoman government, to the overseers, to take uh, pieces, to uh, procure items, monuments from the Parthenon and from the Acropolis. But the Turkish overlords said, no, all you can do is to pick up rubble and pieces from the ground, but you must not touch the temples or remove things from the walls. So the French gathered what they gathered without desecrating the walls because you know, through earthquakes, through damage, through explosions, uh, there were pieces that had dropped to the ground and they were the things that they were allowed illegally, of course, to take because an illegal occupation doesn't, can't give you permission to desecrate a culture and to steal their cultural elements, according to Geoffrey Robinson. And then came Elgin. So this is where Elgin, this is where it gets interesting. Elgin was a Scot according to Geoffrey Robinson, but he just wasn't any Scot. He was an uneducated Scot and a Scot who wanted to desperately become an English Lord. He desperately wanted to become recognized and noticed and to, be, and to fit into the English aristocracy. So in order to do this, he decided that the best thing to do was to adorn his Scottish property with artefacts um, from Athens, from the classics, because everybody wanted to be part of that classical uh, glory. So in his mind, he imagined that he could take from Greece, he could go and take pictures or get paintings and sketches of the sculptures and even get mouldings. So to try and get mouldings of uh, the sculptures 
um, the freezers and those things so he could bring them back to Scotland and then replicate them there and hopefully gain favour in the eyes of the aristocracy. But not even he, not even Elgin, the, uh, the Scot, envisaged that as a British ambassador to Greece, that he could steal the actual marbles. So just to put it into perspective, Elgin, who became Lord Elgin, became the British ambassador to Greece. And in that position, he was able to, um, to uh, get, steal, remove illegally the freezers, the artwork from the uh, Parthenon and the monuments. Because Geoffrey Robinson goes on to say that as luck would have it, uh, Elgin, Elgin's chaplain, who was in Greece, who he sent to Greece before he went to Greece, travelled there and found two Turkish governors who were in charge of the Parthenon, but who were open to corruption. Whilst the Turkish, the Ottoman government, may not have been open to corruption and had set their position in place saying that nobody was allowed to steal, to take, to remove. The chaplain, El Elgin's chaplain, was able to find a couple of uh, governors who were open to corruption. So he was able to, uh, to corrupt them. He was able to entice them. He was able to, uh, to, um, to, to use them by giving them uh, diamond encrusting dueling pistols, horses, I'd imagine sexual favours, um, um, uh, English snuff boxes, suits, suits from Piccadilly, according to Geoffrey Robertson. So these uh, Turkish governors were being bribed by, by the British to turn a blind eye. And this is all that Elgin needed. And as I say, he wasn't in Greece when this was happening. This was all being organized by his chaplain. So they were able to turn a blind eye so that the workmen could remove the freezers off the temple. But, uh, and all this happened through bribes through telescopes that were gold-plated, as I said, through the, through the guns. And all of this plunder, all of this illegally stolen plunder was stored in the British Consul, in the yards of the British Consul and transported back to Britain via British naval ships so that Elgin, as an ambassador, had a double penalty. Not only did he steal, but he also, he also bribed and got these things illegally. So that's the background to it. So he got what he got by corrupting the people and not paying anybody for it, but bribing individuals to turn a blind eye. The British Museum, like many cultures, uh, look back and try to recreate the history by coming up with bullshit stories, according to Geoffrey Robinson, where they say that Elgin had a firman, which is a license from the Sultan to be able to remove the um, artifacts, the freezers from the Parthenon, and hence he had permission. But uh, this is where it gets interesting because Geoffrey Robinson says that in his research, he finds that all the firmans that the Turks presented from 1800 to 1810 um, were recorded. And there is no firman there to say that uh, Elgin could in fact 
take these, uh, this artwork and remove it from the site. All there is is a letter that says that Elgin could take moulds of, uh, of statues of, uh, and, and imprints and just remove and take rubble that had been dropped to the ground. So this is where it gets even more interesting according to the great Geoffrey Robinson. In 1816, less than 10 years after the removal of, these, uh, of this artwork, um, Elgin was ill, he was sick, he was dying, he was penniless, his wife had left him. What had happened there was he was in debt and he had to sell and to get some money. So he went to the British government and he lied to them. And the lie that he said, and I'm finishing up shortly, so stick with me. The lie that he said was that when he went to Athens as the British ambassador, the Turks were damaging, were taking down and were ruining the, uh, the artifacts at the Parthenon. And in order to preserve and to save them, to save these artifacts from the Turks, he had no other choice than to remove them and to take them away in order to preserve them. So he presented himself as the savior, the, uh, the knight in shining armor. And the British government believed it and took it hook, line and sinker. But the truth is, according to Geoffrey Robinson, with his research and with his clean thinking, was that Elgin didn't get to Athens till a year after they started ripping the freezers down. So this whole story is a lie. And for this reason, if there is a court case, an international court case, and we have many supporters, including the Chinese, because Elgin's son, so it, an intergenerational um, uh, issue and problem occurs because Elgin's son was involved with uh, the war uh, that the, uh, the British sided with the French when they attacked China. And they burnt down the Summer Palace and stole many artifacts from China. And that's for that reason, Xi Jinping, the Chinese uh, president or premier, is in support of the return and the reunification of the Elgin marbles because China also has an issue with Britain, whereas the French plundered, the British burnt the Summer Palace to the ground and killed many, many people in the process. So uh, there you go. So Australia is one of the 18 countries and they'll, they'll build. And if it does get to the international courts, Geoffrey Robinson says, he wants Australia to also put forward a position because um, it's only right to do this. And of course, the Indigenous Australians have also had their own cultural heritage desecrated uh, in many ways. So a brilliant, brilliant night, a brilliant day. Thank you for anybody who has the patience to listen to me on this topic. But it's something that I find really, really interesting. As I said, I was mesmerized last night. You could hear a, p a pin drop. People had held their breaths to hear Jeffrey Robinson go through and uh, explain the strategy, the case. And as he said, it's not about Greece. 
It's not about Greece. It's not about the Greeks. It's about all of us. The civilized world needs to have this artwork, this first newsreel of the civilized world brought back together, reunited as one in its birthplace so that us and future generations can get to enjoy it and to uh, appreciate it. Anyway, thank you once again. Let me uh, just turn it around and say a thank you. So to all my friends and family, thank you for joining me on this episode of Jim's 5 AM Club. AM Club. It is without doubt the longest one that I've done, but it's the one that I've done with real passion. So thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for su supporting me. And thank you to the Athenian Association, Jim Tsoulakis, for being the, uh, the chair last night. It was a wonderful, wonderful event, attended by Greeks and people from other uh, cultures, because as we said, it's a subject which is important for each and every one of us. So let's finish off with a positive affirmation. I'm alive, I am well, I feel absolutely great. To my friends and family, stay connected, stay relevant, stay reasonable. And most importantly, let's continue the charge. I can see whales breaching off the uh, point here. It's a glorious, a perfect, perfect morning. And it's a great day to uh, express this wonderful, wonderful dream. Um, for all people, as we said, for all people to be able to acknowledge and to be able to preserve that first newsreel, that first picture of us as a free, democratic civilization. Yasas, take care. We like ya, and bye for now. Ha, ha, ha.